Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the UPSC perspective. Today we have taken up important articles from the Hindu newspaper. Topics which we are going to discuss are displayed on your screen. Let's begin the discussion. Now our first discussion is based on this article which appears on page number 10. Context of this article is that Bombay High Court on Friday said that before it considers the effect of amended IT information rules on the fundamental rights of citizens, it needs to know the boundaries and limits of three words. And what are the words? Fake, false and misleading. Also, court said the rules say action would be taken when some content or information is fake, false and misleading and some authority and in this case it is FCU that is fact checking unit is assuming the power to unequivocally say that the content is false or not. So to consider the effects of amended IT rules on the fundamental rights, court should know the boundaries and limits of these three words. Now you know that this article talks about IT that is Intermediary Guidelines and Digital Media Ethics Code Amendment Rules 2023. Now as you know that government policies and interventions for the development in various sectors is important theme under GS Paper 2. Also, this article highlights the importance of IT rules and you know that awareness in the fields of IT is another important theme under GS Paper 3. So in this discussion, we'll take up what is fake news, how it is a challenge, then we'll discuss what are the current regulations available in India, then we'll see what are IT rules and what are its concerns. Then we'll discuss challenges in curbing fake news and we'll end our discussion with a way forward. Also, UPSC has been asking question based on important aspects related to IT. Like this question based on use of internet by non-state actors came in year 2050. Another question based on vital factors related to the implementation of information and communication technology came in year 2019. So with this, we can see that this theme is quite important. Also, Rules and regulation which form part of the current developments also form an important theme for UPSC prelims examination. Like this question based on solid waste management rules came in year 2019. This question based on industrial employment rules 2018 came in year 2019. This question based on extended producer responsibility which is a quite important aspect of e-waste management and handling rules 2011 this question came in year 2019. So with this, we can see that rules and regulations form an important theme for UPSC prelims examination. So now, let us understand what is fake news and how it is different from misinformation. Though there is no official definition of fake news, but it can be defined on the basis of its occurrence and repercussions. Now, fake news is an inaccurate, sometimes sensationalistic report that is created to gain attention, mislead, deceive or damage our reputation. Unlike misinformation which is inaccurate because our reporter has confused facts. See fake news is created with the intent to manipulate something or someone and it can spread quickly when it provides this information that is aligned with the audience point of view because such content is not likely to be questioned or discounted. Let's understand the difference between the two with the help of example. So there was an article with a title that government announces mandatory linking of Aadhaar card with social media accounts to curb fake news. Now this article claims that the Indian government has announced a new policy requiring mandatory linking of Aadhaar with social media accounts in order to combat fake news. However, Upon further investigation, it is discovered that there is no credible source or official government statement to support this claim. Now this article spread through unknown or unverified sources and lacks evidence of its authenticity. So this is an example of fake news as it is intentionally fabricated information presented as factual news to mislead readers. Now there was a social media post which claims that the Indian government has made it mandatory to link Aadhaar with social media accounts to curb fake news. Now this post has been widely shared and circulated 
leading to panic and confusion among the public. However, upon verification, it is revealed that there is no credible official source to confirm this claim. Now, the misinformation may have been unintentionally shared by well-meaning individuals who did not verify the information before spreading it. So, this is done intentionally and this is done unintentionally. Now, let's discuss few important implications of fake news. Now, implication is more related to the intention and consequences of spread of fake news. The first in this is conditioning of knowledge. Now, levels of penetration of social media has enabled the spread of fake news as wildfire. In lack of proper authentication check soon, it becomes a validated knowledge, thus helping in creating a wrongly modulated environment against or in favor of anything. The best example of this is that our national anthem being recognized as world best anthem by UNESCO. Another example is mob lynching in Maharashtra's Palghar. Let me tell you how. So there was a post or article on social media claiming involvement of a specific religious or ethnic group in child trafficking, which goes viral on social media. So because of the conditioning, a mob fueled by anger and fear gathers, hunts down individuals from the targeted group and violently lynches them without verifying the authenticity of the news. So the incident results in injuries, loss of life and widespread fear and tension among communities. And later it is revealed that the news was fake. So see how this incident highlights the serious consequence of spreading misinformation. Next implication is polarization and politicization. Now, fake news is being used as a tool by political parties as well as prominent news channels to build a narrative which is suitable to their cause. The end result is again a fabricated environment which often serves as narrow objective. The best example of this is Union Home Ministry used the picture of Spain-Morocco border in its annual report to show that it had installed floodlights in border areas. Now with this you can imagine that how deep this problem is. Another implication is social disharmony and part of this you have already seen in this example. So fake narratives often creates hatred among communities. This result into incitement of violence and fake news has also been used to radicalization of youth which poses threat to national security at various levels. And the very good example of this is use of fake news in Mujafanagar rights of 2013 and recent fake videos of migrant workers in Tamil Nadu which created an atmosphere of fear and stress among the population. So these are the important implications of fake news. So now let's see different regulations related to fake news in India. Now one thing you should know that India does not have a robust and exclusive framework for curbing the menace of the fake news. However, government use different sections under different act to curb this problem. The first in this is use of section 69A of the Information Technology Act 2000. This act has granted itself greater power to strike down any unpalatable content. Also, some provisions of Disaster Management Act 2005 and if you remember, during COVID time, government evoked Epidemic Diseases Act 1897 to regulate the fake news. Next is Indian Penal Code 1860 deals with fake news specifically causing rights and defamation cases. Then later, government has come up with information technology, intermediary guidelines and digital media ethic code rules 2021 to regulate content by online publishers of news and social media intermediaries. And now, recent amendment in this information technology, intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code rules have drawn criticism from various experts who term it as an attempt by government to curb the exercise of free speech and expression. So these are different regulations deals with fake news in India. Now, having seen the difference between fake news and misinformation and what are the implications of fake news and regulations. Now, let's discuss important amendments to information technology, intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code rules 2023. Now, government notified amendments for open, safe, trusted and accountable internet. These amendments 
lay out a comprehensive framework for online gaming ecosystem and also deals with fact checking related to online content pertaining to government the first in this is obligations on part of intermediaries now it has been made obligatory on part of intermediaries to make reasonable effort to not host publish or share any online game that can cause the user harm or the content that has not been verified as a permissible online game by an online gaming self regulatory body or bodies designated by the central government second is authority of regulatory body now the self regulatory body will have the authority to inquire and satisfy itself that the online games does not involve wagering on any outcome next amendment rules also cast additional obligations on online gaming intermediaries in relation to online games involving real money now these include the displaying of a mark of verification by the self regulatory body on such games then informing their users of the policy for withdrawal or refund of deposits manner of determination and distribution of winnings fees and other charges payable obtaining the kyc details of the users and not giving credit or enabling financing by third parties to the users now amendment rules now also make it obligatory on the intermediaries to not to publish share or host fake false or misleading information in respect of any business of the central government these fake false or misleading information will identified by the notified fact check unit of central government so these are the important amendments to information technology intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code 2023 Now let's discuss few important concerns about these amendments. The first in this is it is in contravention to safe harbor protections in section 79 of the IT Act. Basically this act allows intermediaries to avoid liabilities for what third parties post on their website. Now under new amendment intermediaries are liable for this. Second is these notified amendments can bypass section 69A of the IT Act 2000 which elucidates the procedure to issue take down orders also according to author a threat to remove a platform's immunity for content that is flagged by a government unit would create a chilling effect on the right to speech and expression that is article 19 on online platforms so these are the concerns related to recent amendments now let us discuss few challenges in curbing fake news in india first in this is regulation versus rights conundrum now flagging of fake news often gets entangled between debate of intention like here government trying to regulate this problem with the help of new amendment 2023 because it will be helpful to maintain tranquility and order and on the other side critics are raising concern and term it as an attempt of curbing free speech so this shows the regulation versus rights conundrum next is low digital literacy now as per india inequality report 2022 around 70% of the population has poor or no digital connectivity now such a low level of digital literacy acts as a barrier in verification and authenticity of the news because here news spread even before verification process can be initiated next is that there is no dedicated framework now lack of robust and exclusive framework has affected the efforts in curbing fake news at every stages for example insufficient infrastructure for verification no penalties etc all have contributed in flourishing of the strength next is inherent nature of ict now here anonymity of content creator poses greatest challenge in front of the regulatory bodies as well as intermediaries to track and address the issue of fake news so these are few important challenges in curbing fake news in india now let's discuss few futuristic solution to solve problem of fake news in india and this entailed involvement of all the stakeholders in this loop and first in this is user so 
digital literacy of users about verification and authentication of any published facts or reports should be promoted. Also, also sensitization of publishers and content creators about the impacts and repercussions of the fake news and its propagation should be done. Another stakeholder is intermediaries. These should be encouraged to formulate policy and actions in tracking and removing fake news. Another stakeholder is government. So government should strengthen regulations and their application, which is of utmost importance. Fact check mechanisms should be made robust and effective. Also, transparency in identification and regulation should be adopted to address the concerns of various stakeholders. So a dedicated portal can be developed where real-time take on fake news can be maintained. As in some states, if a fake news is treated, police immediately respond with a warning retweet. Now our next discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number one. Context is that Gujarat High Court on Friday dismissed Rahul Gandhi's plea seeking a stay on his conviction in a criminal defamation case over his Modi surname remark. Now with this order, Rahul Gandhi will continue to remain suspended as a member of parliament and he will not be able to contest elections. He can appeal the larger bench of the Gujarat High Court and the Supreme Court. So this particular raises two issues which are extremely pertinent in Indian context. One is disqualification of elected members of the House. Another one is criminal defamation and its utility in democratic India. And these two are important theme under GS paper 2. So in this discussion, we'll deal with what is defamation. Then we'll see how defamation is an exception to the right to freedom of speech. Then we'll discuss why defamation is a crime. And then we'll see why defamation should remain a criminal offense. Now we'll start our discussion with what is defamation. It refers to the act of publication of defamatory content that lowers the reputation of an individual or an entity when observed through the perspective of an ordinary man. Now defamation can occur in two forms. First is libel, another one is slander. Now what is libel? It is a kind of defamation that is present in some permanent form, such as writing, printed or picture. Whereas slander is a kind of defamation that is present in an unwritten form, such as spoken words, gestures or representation made with hands. In English law, there is a distinction made between both of the forms under the categories of criminal defamation and civil defamation. Under criminal law, only libel is an offence and not slander. Whereas in civil law, libel is an offence just like in criminal law. But the change here is that slander is also an offence when provided with proof. Now in Indian law, both libel and slander are recognised as criminal offences under section 499 of IPC. The offence of defamation was included by Lord Thomas Macaulay for the first time in the draft IPC in 1838 and codified in law in 1860 based on prevailing English law. So now this is all about what is defamation. So now let's understand how defamation is an exception to the right to freedom of speech. Now article 19 of Indian constitution grants various freedom to its citizen. However, Article 19 subclause 2 impose reasonable exemptions to freedom of speech and expression granted under Article 19.1a that is contempt of court, defamation and incitement to an offence are some exceptions. So now let's see a few legal provisions. Now section 499 and 500 of IPC deals with criminal defamation while section 499 defines Offence of defamation, section 500 defines the punishment for it. So according to section 499, whosoever by words, either spoken or intended to be read by signs or by visible representation, makes or publish any imputation concerning any person intending to harm or knowing or having reason to believe that such imputation will harm the reputation of such person 
is said except in the cases here and after expected to defame that person now under section 500 whoever defames another shall be punished with a simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or with both so these are the legal provisions related to criminal defamation now let's understand why defamation is a crime now as reputation is an asset to each and everyone any damage to such asset can be legally dealt with so defamation laws have been enacted to prevent person maliciously using their right to freedom of speech and expression because Indian law has rightly not made any distinction between libel and slander. Otherwise, there could have been chances for committing slander and escaping from laws that there is no written publication of matter. To understand it in a better way, let us take example of Subramanian Swami versus Union of India. In year 2014, Dr. Subramanian Swami alleged corruption on Ms. Jay Lalita, after which Ms. Jay Lalita framed defamation charges on Dr. Swami. He, in turn, challenged the constitutional validity of Section 499 and Section 500 of the IPC. The court, in this case, upheld the constitutional validity of the offence of criminal defamation and ruled out that Section 499 and Section 500 of the Indian Penal Code impose reasonable restrictions on the right to freedom of speech and expression. So now, let's discuss why defamation should remain a criminal offence. So first we'll see arguments in favour. First thing this is income inequality. Defamation should remain a penal offence in India as defamer may be too poor to compensate the victim in some cases. Second argument is anonymity provided by internet. Since there is no mechanism to censor the internet from within, online defamation could only be adequately countered by retaining defamation as a criminal offence. Another argument is, criminalization of defamation is part of state's compelling interest to protect the right to dignity and good reputation of its citizens, mentioned under Article 21. Now, as Sections 499 and 500 have 10 exceptions and these exceptions clearly exclude from its ambit any speech that is truthful made in good faith and or is for public good so these are important arguments in favor that defamation should remain a criminal offense now let's see arguments in against first in this category is it is against the global trend as many countries worldwide are in favor of treating defamation as civil wrong, not as criminal offense. Also, in 2011, Human Rights Committee of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights called upon states to abolish criminal defamation, noting that it intimidates citizens and makes them shy away from exposing wrongdoings. Second argument in this category is misuse by influential. Now, misuse of law as instrument of harassment is also pervasive in India. Often, prosecutors' complaint is taken at face value by courts, which send out routine notice for the appearance of defendants without any preliminary examination. So thus, the process itself becomes the punishment. Criminal defamation has a severe effect on society. For instance, state uses it as means to coerce the media and political opponents into adopting self-censorship and unwarranted self-restraint. Also, the law can be used by groups or sections claiming to have been hurted or insulted and abuse the process by initiating multiple proceedings in different places. Another argument is defamatory acts that may harm public order are covered by Section 124, 153, and 153a so criminal defamation does not serve any overarching public interest even though section 499 provides safeguards by means of exceptions the threat of criminal prosecution is in itself unreasonable and excessive so these are few relevant arguments 
against treating defamation as a criminal offence. So having seen arguments in favour and against, one can conclude that there is definitely a need for defamation law to ensure that reputations are protected. However, the answer lies in strengthening civil defamation and redress provisions as in UK which has outlawed criminal defamation. Now, our last discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number 10 in the Hindu newspaper. Context is that later this year, the first test runs of hydrogen powered buses will likely be under way in Delhi followed by other states. The buses developed under a joint venture involving Indian Oil Corporation Limited and Tata Motors will ply as part of a scientific test experiment between Delhi and Faridabad. Now, if one would look into the slavers, topic of conservation, environmental pollution and degradation has been mentioned under GS paper 3. Further, debate over carbon emission always encompasses conundrum of conservation or development. Now, issues relating to development has also mentioned under GS paper 3. So, in this discussion, we will look into important key terms related to hydrogen. So, we'll see INDC targets in India. We'll discuss Panchamit strategy. Then we'll see how hydrogen as fuel holds significance. We'll see challenges in production of hydrogen-based energy and we'll end with a way forward. Furthermore, if you look into the UPSC previous year questions, themes of climate change and various initiatives hold significance from the examination perspective. So let's start our discussion. So as we know that the entire debate around the climate change culminated and acquired the center stage in the year 1992 in the shape of Rio Earth Summit. Here, world recognized the need of collective efforts to mitigate the causes and impacts of the global warming and climate change. Greenhouse gases were identified as prime reason behind the global warming and need for mitigation of their emission levels were to be given priority. In line with this, deliberation Kyoto Protocol came into existence in the year 1997. So, let us understand what is intended nationally determined contributions, that is INDCs. Now, countries across the globe adopted an historic international climate agreement at UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of the Parties, that is COP21, in Paris in December 2015. In anticipation of this moment, countries publicly outlined what post-2020 climate actions they intended to take under the new international agreement known as the Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. The climate actions communicated in these INDCs largely determine whether the world achieves the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement, that is, to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees centigrade, to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade, and to achieve net zero emissions in the second half of this century. So in this regard, let's understand what is net zero emission. Net zero emissions will be achieved when all greenhouse gas emissions released by humans are counterbalanced by removing greenhouse gases from atmosphere in a process known as carbon removal. In this, first, human-caused emission, such as those from fossil fuel vehicles and factories, should be reduced as close to zero as possible and any remaining greenhouse gases should then be balanced with an equivalent amount of carbon removal, which can happen through restoring forests or using direct air capture and storage technology. Now, let's see what is India's approach to achieve net zero emission. Government of India has articulated and put across the concerns of developing countries at the 26th session of the Conference of the Parties, that is COP26, to UNHCCC held in Glasgow, United Kingdom. Further, India presented the following five nectar elements 
that is Panchamrit of India's climate action. First in this is to reach 500 gigawatt non-fossil energy capacity by 2030. Then 50% of its energy requirements from renewable energy by 2030. Then reduction of total projected carbon emission by 1 billion tons from now to 2030. Then reduction of the carbon intensity of the economy by 45% by 2030 over 2005 levels. Then achieving the target of net zero emission by 2070. So in line of these commitments, hydrogen fuel holds a significant need for its case. Hydrogen is expected to replace fossil fuel in the future. One of the primary criteria for the nation's ecologically sustainable energy security is the production of such fuel using renewable energy. The Indian government is taking a number of steps to make the transition from fossil fuel and fossil fuel-based feedstocks to green hydrogen easier. Green hydrogen policy announced by the government incentivizes producer of this form of power. According to the International Renewable Energy Agency, hydrogen will make up 12% of the energy mix by 2050. The agency in its World Energy Transitions Outlook report also suggested that about 66% of this hydrogen used must come from water instead of natural gas. So green hydrogen is seen as driving source to power our industries and light our homes with the zero emission of carbon dioxide. Second important significance is hydrogen as an energy rich source. Hydrogen is the most abundant element on the earth but it's not found in pure which is required to be used as fuel. It has energy density almost three times that of diesel. Green hydrogen can act as an energy storage option which would be essential to meet intermittencies of renewable energy in the future. So hydrogen is an energy rich source because it is abundant, it has high energy density and it can act as energy storage option. Now because of India's ideal geographic circumstances and abundance of natural indigrants, India has a tremendous advantage in green hydrogen generation. Now having seen the important significance of hydrogen fuel. Now let's discuss different types of hydrogen. So the first in this is black hydrogen. It is produced by the use of fossil fuel. Whereas pink hydrogen is produced through electrolysis but using energy from nuclear power sources. Then next is brown hydrogen. It is produced using coal where the emissions are released to the air. Then next is grey hydrogen. It is produced from natural gas where the associated emissions are released to the air. Then next is blue hydrogen. It is produced from natural gas. But what's the difference between grey and blue? Here emissions are captured using carbon capture and storage. And here emissions are released to the air. Then next is green hydrogen. It is a zero carbon fuel made by electrolysis using renewable power that is from wind and solar to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. This green hydrogen can be utilized for the generation of power from natural sources. For example, wind or solar system and it will be a major step forward in achieving the target of net zero emission. And you should know that less than 1% of hydrogen produced this green hydrogen. So now having discussed what is green hydrogen, let's see important benefits of using green hydrogen for India. First in this is high energy demand. India is the fourth largest energy consuming country behind China, US, European Union and according to IES forecasts, India will overtake European Union to become the world's third energy consumer by the year 2030. Next benefit is transition to clean energy. Green hydrogen can drive India's transition to clean energy. 
combat climate change. Under the Paris Climate Agreement, India pledged to reduce the emission intensity of its economy by 33 to 35% from 2005 levels by 2030. The next is reduction in import dependency. See, it will help to reduce import dependency on fossil fuels. Next is indigenization of technology. The localization of electrolyzer production and the development of green hydrogen projects can create a new green technologies market in India. So these are the important benefits of using green hydrogen for India. Also, you should know that Union Budget for 2021-22 to has announced a National Hydrogen Energy Mission, that is NHM, that will draw up a roadmap for using hydrogen as an energy source. Now, having seen the benefits, now let's discuss few important challenges in the development of hydrogen energy. The first in this is technology. How it is a challenge? As Hydrogen is a rich source of energy, but the challenge is to compress or liquefy it. Basically, it needs to be kept at a stable minus 253 degrees centigrade, far below the temperature of minus 163 degrees centigrade at which liquefied natural gas is stored, making its prior to use cost very high. The next is prohibitive cost. The production cost of green hydrogen has been considered to be a prime obstacle. Researches conducted by the International Renewable Energy Agency indicate that the cost its production is predicted to be about $1.5 per kilogram by 2030 for countries with eternal sunshine and huge unoccupied area if several conservative measures are implemented. So its production cost is quite high. Next challenge is related to manufacturing and deployment of electrolyzers. See, manufacturing and deployment of electrolyzers will have to increase at an unprecedented rate by 2050 from the current capacity of 0.3 gigawatts to almost 5,000 gigawatts. Then next, for transportation fuel cells, hydrogen must be cost competitive with conventional fuels and technologies on a per mile basis. Then last but not the least, fuel cells which convert hydrogen fuel to usable energy for cars are still expensive. The hydrogen station infrastructure needed to refuel hydrogen fuel cells is still widely underdeveloped. So these are the important challenges related to the development of hydrogen energy. So now having seen the challenges, let's discuss few solutions. First is investment in R&D. Commercial use of hydrogen as a fuel and in industries necessitates a massive investment in R&D and infrastructure for hydrogen production, storage, transportation and demand development. Then next is learnings from the initiatives from around the world. Even oil producing nations such as Saudi Arabia is prioritizing plans to manufacture this source of energy by utilizing idle land banks for solar and wind energy generation. Why? Because green hydrogen fuel made by electrolyzers using renewable energy or power from wind and solar. So it is working to establish a mega dollar 5 billion green hydrogen manufacturing unit covering a land size as large as that of Belgium in the northern west part of the country. So it is high time to catch up with the rest of the world by going in for clean energy, decarbonizing economy and adopting green hydrogen as an environment friendly and safe fuel for the next generations. Then adoption of renewable circular sustainable fuel utilization cycle. See world is presently experimenting the dawning of hydrogen energy in all sectors that includes energy production, storage and distribution, electricity, heat and cooling for buildings and households, the industry, transportation and the fabrication of feedstock. 
energy efficiency and sustainability are two important factors driving the transition from the present fossil fuel based economy to circular economy that is renewable circular sustainable fuel utilization cycle that will characterize the highly efficient engineering and the energy technological choices of the 21st century